chapter twenty one of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one a scrap of paper the long cold winter of eighteen seventy which froze all the fowls except the six sad roosters and followed the failure of the potato and corn crops was also disastrous to the bees the hives had increased to a fine long row in the years that followed the capture of the first swarm discovered by tumbler the bear and the honey had been a welcome addition to the soldiers simple fare but the cold weather had destroyed every swarm leaving only bee bread and some half-consumed old combs from which the dead bees had fallen in a dry mass upon the bench below while coleman and bromley were engaged in planting philip was making an effort to find a new bee tree he had noticed some bees buzzing about the wild flowers on the ridge by the old flagging station and he determined to line them by a method he had seen his uncle practice when he was a boy in ohio he made a little box with a sliding cover into which he put a small honeycomb and taking the old yellow rooster under one arm for company or perhaps for luck he went over to where the flowers grew near the northern end of the plateau he set down the old rooster on the ground and opened the box on a stone in front of him and waited watching his bait it was something like fishing in the old mill pond of which he had once been fond and he found a singular fascination about watching the opening in the box as he used to watch his bobber the june weather on the mountain was like may in the ohio valley and the sweet smell of the flowers carried his mind back to his old home he had no longer to wait for the first nibble than he had waited in the old days for the first stir of his cork and the spreading ring on the water a bee alighted on the lid and then made his way down into the box after loading his legs with honey the bee reappeared and rising into the air flew away to the south philip followed the small insect with his eyes and then picking up the old rooster he came on for a hundred yards in the same direction and set his bait as before this time he had two bees in his box and when they had loaded themselves they flew away in the same direction as the first they disappeared so soon above the tree-tops that he thought the swarm was not far away but every time he advanced the loaded bees continued to fly south until he had moved the paralyzed old rooster by easy stages the whole length of the plateau and the bees which came in greater numbers now rose into the air and flew in a bee-line over the top of the southern cliff philip was disgusted at this result of his bee-hunt as any fisherman after wading to his middle in a cold river to humour a fine trout might be to lose his victim at last in the foaming rapids but he knew to a certainty that there was a bee-tree somewhere beyond the thus far unscalable southern cliff for the present the vision of honey was abandoned and the economy of the camp where food was now alarmingly low was cunningly exercised to discover edible things in lieu of the corn which after the planting was all stored in the nine gunny sacks which had fallen from the balloon the sacks were piled one upon another in a small heap behind the hopper in the mill and the six sad roosters had to shift for themselves as best they could except the old fellow who was paralyzed and for him they gathered grubs and worms and saved the crumbs that fell from the table it appeared possible to the minds of the soldiers that the liver-coloured slabs of fungus which grew out of the sides of the chestnut trees and the birches might be as palatable and nourishing as mushrooms they broke off one of these pieces one day which was shaped like the half of an inverted saucer and was moist and clammy on the under side they had a superstition that such things were poison they had never heard of any one eating the like and after they had stewed it in their camp kettle inviting as its odor was they sniffed and hesitated and feared to taste it in the end they shook their heads and spilled the contents of the kettle on the ground where as soon as their backs were turned tumbler and the five sad roosters fell to devouring the rejected food <laughs> 
when the soldiers discovered what their domestic animals were about the bear was licking his chops and the old roosters were waltzing about in the grass picking up the last morsels of the feast they regretted their carelessness and rather expected that before night the old paralyzed rooster would be their only living companion on the mountain when however the bear and the five sad roosters survived the test and seemed rather to flourish on the new food the soldiers took heart and found the fungus not only good but so much like meat that it was quite startling to their vegetarian palates after eating all of this peculiar food product that grew on the plateau they gleaned the field above the deep gorge and as a last resort they made a hunting expedition to the half acre of rocks and brambles where they had found the mica terrible as the passage through the cavern had at first seemed to the mind of lieutenant coleman the lapse of time and a better acquaintance with the interior of the subterraneous tunnel made it but a commonplace covered way to the field of mica not that the soldiers had any further use for the mineral wealth which was so lavishly strewn among the rocks it was as valueless to them now as the button-hook found in the handbag of alligator skin to go now and then through the underground passage however if only for the purpose of looking at the world outside from the viewpoint of their newest territorial possession was a temptation which no landed proprietors could resist the little shelf afforded them a glimpse to the south of the cove road which on account of certain intervening trees was not to be had from the plateau above several cabins could be seen smoking in the small clearings which surrounded them but since the telescope had gone into the avalanche with philip there was but poor satisfaction in looking at them they found a single piece of the liver-coloured fungus growing on the root of a half-decayed old chestnut and even this they regarded as well worth their journey they spent some time wandering about the mica shelf and when lieutenant coleman and philip were boring their torches into the ground one after the other to rid them of the dead coal and getting ready for the start back bromley who had been poking about among the rocks called to them in a tone of voice that indicated a pretty important discovery in the stone line he was down on his hands and knees on the turf boring his toes into the soil and as his comrades approached him he exclaimed i haven't touched it yet just come and look naturally coleman and philip thought he had found some curious reptile instead however of this being the case bromley was kneeling over a scrap of newspaper which was impaled on a dead twig under the shelter of a rock where neither the sun nor the rain could reach it the torn fragment was scarcely larger than the palm of one's hand and snugly as it was now protected from the weather it was yellow from former exposure and the print was much faded so that parts of it were illegible it was possible however to decipher enough of the small advertisements on the exposed side to show that it was a charleston paper and they knew of course that it must have come by the balloon almost a year before undoubtedly it had lain for a long time on the plateau above exposed to the storms before the wind had tossed it over the cliff and landed it in such a wonderful way on the twig under the cover of the rock on the reverse side most of the print was fairly legible the scrap was torn from the top of the paper and had on it a capital g which was the only letter left of the name of the paper the line below read september date of month gone eighteen blank o the centre column was headed foreign world the hon charles snowden m p goes down with his yacht earthquake in spain four distinct shocks felt no dam blank done movement of specie london september four the steam yacht of the hon charles snowden m p which was wrecked yesterday off the old head of kinsale on the south coast of ireland was this morning looted by thieves the rear blank plate carpets upholstery fittings as well as quantity of storage sails and stores were taken lights were seen from the mainland at two o'clock this morning when a heavy sea was running
later the hon charles snowden and the first officer of the boat lost their lives by the swamping of the raft on which they had embarked madrid september four four distinct shocks of an earthquake this morning were felt in the province of granada in the south of spain coming as t shocks have twenty-four hours later than the answers reported on the coast of italy by was indicate that the disturbance no damage is reported in from the vineyards what remained of the right-hand column bore to the soldiers these surprising words in sentences and parts of sentences local happenings charleston r e lee as a general sherman at the war office the controversy just concluded between the curry mercury on the strategic merits of the two command developed nothing new the sherman cam ending in the city of atlanta ably discussed and with justice to the dead comma the great march to the sea but more brilliant achievement of the war and its in another column south is satisfied happy endin when coleman and philip caught the first glimpse of the scrap of paper tattered and yellow they believed it to be some fragment of the blue book which they themselves had discarded the exposed surface was almost as free of print as if it had been treated with potash and looked as insignificant as a dried leaf or a section of corn husk bromley on the other hand had examined it more closely and just as coleman began to laugh at him he put out his hand and removed the scrap of paper from the twig which held it fast and as he turned it over to the light he was nearly as much surprised as his companions the three were down on their knees in an instant eagerly devouring the words of the headlines and philip being on the right it happened that his eyes were the first to fall on the name of general sherman sherman at the war office he cried what does that mean it means we have been deceived said coleman i hurrah cried philip leaping up and dancing about until the rags of his tattered clothing fluttered in the sunlight hurrah uncle billy is alive he never was killed at all if that message was false they were all false all lies lies what fools we have been we must leave the mountain to-morrow to-night we have been the victims of an infamous deception exclaimed lieutenant coleman let us go back to the house at once and determine what is to be done against this undue haste bromley remonstrated feebly for he himself was laboring under unusual excitement his eyes were so dimmed by a suffusion of something very like tears tears of anger that he could read no further for the moment and he put the paper carefully into his pocket and picked up his torch and followed his comrades sulkily into the cavern upon bromley's peculiar character this new revelation had a depressing effect he still entertained doubts if the new hope was finally realized his joy would be as deep and sincere as that of the others for the present the thought that they might have been deceived all along angered him he had an inclination to stop even then and examine the paper more fully by torchlight but the underground passage was long and the pine knot he carried was burning low he felt obliged to hasten on after coleman and philip who were now considerably in advance they were still in view however and as he held the torch to one side that which he saw far up the narrowing cavern had a softening effect on his conflicting emotions he even laughed at the grotesque exhibition for the small figures of coleman and philip were dancing and hugging each other and dashing their torches against the rocks in a way that made them look like mad salamanders in the circling flames and sparks such reckless enthusiasm was a condition of mind which george could not understand but the possibility occurred to him that in their wild excitement they might set fire to the house as a beacon light to the people in the valley for they could never get away from the plateau without help from beyond the deep gorge to prevent if possible any rash action on the part of his more excited comrades bromley hurried his pace and in the effort to overtake them soon found himself leaping over obstacles and dodging corners of the rocky wall in a wild race which tended to excite even his phlegmatic nature 
as he ran on that magical sentence sherman at the war office stood out in black letters before his eyes what war office if the paper referred to the war office of the united states it certainly would have so designated a department of a foreign government if there were two governments it would be necessary to say which war office was meant if the old government in whose military service he had enlisted as a boy had regained its own the phrase sherman at the war office would be natural and correct and with this triumphant conviction he ran on the faster on the other hand if the confederacy had gained everything at the sickening thought his feet became so heavy that his speed relapsed into a labored walk and the oppressive air of the cavern seemed to stifle him he would reach his companions as soon as possible and compel them to examine the scrap of paper and weigh its every word it was beginning to dawn upon bromley that they had acted like children and when he finally came out at the entrance to the cave of the bats into the subdued light under the dark pines he found philip and coleman waiting for him and clamoring for another look at the scrap of paper there was not much to read in the fraction of a column that interested them most but philip and coleman were determined to twist the reading to the support of their new hopes and bromley naturally took the opposite view heartily wishing however that the others might prove him mistaken there was something in the reading of the broken sentences that tended to quiet the enthusiasm of lieutenant coleman and when bromley could make himself heard he called attention to the second sentence the sherman campaign ending at the blank atlanta ably discussed and justice to the dead commander what dead commander if not general sherman if he had lived his campaign would not have ended in atlanta it was evident that there had been a newspaper controversy in charleston on the merits of two campaigns by sherman and lee the atlanta campaign and the march to the sea whatever that might be the latter bromley thought was clearly some achievement of lee's and then he remembered his prophecy on the night when they had changed the name of the plateau from lincoln to sherman territory it proves cried bromley just what i foresaw that after the capture of washington lee led his army across maryland pennsylvania and new jersey living on the country to meet the foreign allies of the confederacy in the harbor of new york it was certainly a brilliant military movement look he cried when the others were silent south is satisfied happy ending but said philip still obstinate what do you make of those five words sherman at the war office how do you get around that why my dear boy said bromley this is only the heading of a newspaper article it does not mean that general sherman was at the war office in person it simply refers to general sherman's record in the war office after all their excitement coleman and philip were obliged to give way to the convincing evidence revealed in the broken sentences they were too tired by this time to consider the bits of foreign news or notice the dates and it was quite dark when they reached the house and went dejected and supperless to bed the next morning they got down the map and looked ruefully at the states which lee must have devastated in his triumphant march with the consent of the others bromley took a pen and traced the probable route by baltimore philadelphia and trenton to the jersey coast of new york harbor bromley was determined to lay out the line of march by harrisburg and was restrained only by physical force which resulted in blotting the map at the point where his clumsy line was arrested they agreed however that lee's victorious army had undoubtedly camped on the lower bay and along the raritan river in the country between perth amboy and the old battlefield of monmouth they were convinced that the map was utterly wrong for after such a march it was doubtful if there were any united states at all the disaster appeared more overwhelming than ever and they hung the map back on the wall in another place however for it was discovered that the rain had beaten through the logs and run down across the pacific side poor as it was they were determined to preserve it 
it was not until late in the afternoon of the day on which they had altered the map that the three soldiers returned to the examination of the scrap of paper which they had agreed from the first could have reached the mountain top only by falling from the balloon the year before how is this cried coleman pointing excitedly to the dates of the foreign telegrams this piece of newspaper could not have come by the balloon the balloon passed over the mountain on september five having left the city of charleston as declared by the tall aeronaut at three thirty o'clock of the afternoon before which was the fourth of september look at the dates for yourself he continued handing the paper to bromley wasn't the honourable m p drowned on the morning of september four can't you read there that the earthquake in spain was on the fourth what of that said bromley you can't make out the date of the paper i don't care what the date of publication was replied coleman if it came by the balloon it was published before september five now please tell me how it could bring european news of the fourth hm said bromley somewhat puzzled if it had been published on the third it couldn't bring news of the fourth that's certain i have it cried philip fred has got the dates of the diary more than a week out of the way we thought the balloon passed on september five it was nearer the fifteenth no exclaimed coleman glaring at philip there is no mistake in the record not a date is omitted leap year was added to the days in february when it came around i make a mistake in the date no sir there is no mistake whatever happens i will stand on the wreck you are right old man cried bromley interrupting him and the paper proves it don't you see the point they have got the atlantic cable down at last and working like a charm the paper was published on the fourth of september it was an afternoon paper and this piece fell from the balloon on the fifth of september they agreed that this was wonderful as explaining without doubt what at first seemed impossible and at the same time verifying the accuracy of the dates in the diary which lieutenant coleman had conducted for more than six years at the time the balloon passed coleman and bromley remembered distinctly the unsuccessful attempts at laying the atlantic cable in the summer of eighteen fifty eight and the fame of cyrus field as its projector and now by the discovery of this scrap of yellow and tattered paper they were made aware that the great project had been continued to a successful issue possibly they were the more keenly interested in this evidence of progress in the world below from having been themselves connected with telegraphing in a modest way at all events they regarded the yellow messenger as one of their most significant possessions and skewered it against the chimney through the very hole made by the dry twig which had held it so long under the cover of the rock awaiting their inspection it was near the end of july now and the spears of corn which had thrust their tiny dark leaf lances out of the mellow earth had first turned yellow and then withered and died a few plants here and there had escaped the ravages of the grubs but the yield would be insignificant and they were good enough farmers by this time to know that to plant more would be only a waste of the small store of food they had left if the lives of the fowls had been spared it might have been different at the time the ground had been spaded the five sad roosters had done all that lay in their power to exterminate the grubs but their capacity was not the capacity of the four hundred fowls of the season before the potatoes had suffered though in less degree from the same hidden enemy and unless something could be done to increase their food supply the three soldiers would be reduced to the verge of starvation before another winter came around they might yet be forced to abandon their vegetarian principles and to eat the bear and the six old roosters rather than do anything so inhuman they declared they would find some way to open communication with the people in the valley they might easily have planted a larger area in former years and stored up corn against a failure in the crop but of this they had never thought the morning after they had discovered the scrap of paper on the mica shelf they all went solemnly to the mill and watched philip set the machinery in motion and grind the first of the nine small sacks of corn
the whir of the wheels and the hum of the stones in the midst of the splashing of the water outside made the sweetest of music in their ears but the song of the mill was of brief duration when the last colonels began to dance on the old cavalry bootleg in the bottom of the hopper the miller shut off the water and in the silence that followed the three soldiers looked ruefully at the small heap of yellow meal on the floor of the dusty bin it was not more than enough to keep themselves and the paralyzed old rooster alive for a week if they relied upon the meal alone in nine weeks they would be out of bread and the golden mill would be a useless possession discovery was their only hope of further subsistence they had made some remarkable finds in the past but at the beginning of their eighth year on the mountain it would seem that no secrets of the plateau had escaped the prying eyes of these enterprising young men philip reminded his comrades of the bee tree which was undoubtedly stored with honey beyond the southern cliff but this they had always regarded as impassable from the mica shelf they could see that it was a narrow ledge and not a higher level and although the small shelf extended a trifle beyond it the soldiers had seen no way of scaling the rocks which rose from the brambles and mica so as to reach the territory beyond the southern ledge they had never seen these rocks from above nor any part of the brambly half-acre for the reason that the edge of the plateau shelved off at a dangerous incline of smooth granite which it was not possible to look over otherwise they might have discovered the outside half-acre long before they found the cavernous path which led to it bromley now proposed to be lowered to the outer edge of the shelving rock by means of the breeches buoy which had lifted philip from his perilous seat on the avalanche it was not at all a dangerous experiment and as soon as he was in a position to examine the rocks below the base of the southern cliff he saw a narrow ledge which would afford a sure foothold and which led away upward until it was lost behind the rocks although invisible from below it could be reached by their longest ladder whether the path along the ledge would enable them to reach the top of the mountain to the south remained to be determined they were all on fire with the fever of exploration and they had no doubt that the rich bee tree would reward their efforts with new stores of honey that night by means of the canvas strap they lowered their ladder over the ledge until it rested on the mica shelf next morning bright and early philip got out his small honey box and would have taken the old paralytic rooster along but for the implements it was necessary to carry besides their torches in passing through the cavern their hands would be full with the axe and a pail for water and another in which to bring back the honey it was a clear july day with a soft south wind breathing on the mountain and when the three soldiers arrived on their brambly half-acre they found their ladder leaning safely against the rocks where they had lowered it after they had smothered their torches and laid them by to await their return they tried the ladder which proved to be too short by a couple of rungs to reach the path on the cliff at first they thought they should be obliged to return and make a longer one but lieutenant coleman was somewhat of an engineer on fortifications and under his directions they fell to work building a platform of stones and timber which afforded the latter a secure foundation and raised it safely to the brow of the ledge bromley went ahead with the axe and coleman and philip followed with the pails the soldiers had brought along their overcoats for the fight with the bees and when they put them on after the rough exercise of handling the stones they found them rather oppressive to their brown shoulders whose summer costume usually consisted of one suspender bromley was very red in the face as he pushed along on the rocky path cutting away a root or an overhanging limb which obstructed their passage End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two the deserted house 
the path up which the three soldiers were climbing was not a path at all in the sense of its having been worn by the feet of men or animals it was at first a narrow ledge and then the dry bed of a watercourse which overflowed for a few days when the snows melted in the spring and was walled in by an outer ledge and turned upward at an easy incline which offered no serious obstacle to the progress of the explorers the soldiers halted midway and took off their oppressive overcoats and wiped their red faces the top of the mountain beyond the southern wall was about half the area of their own plateau and to the consternation of the three soldiers in the very centre of the tract stood a log house flanked by some tumble-down sheds this unexpected discovery was so startling that they retreated below the bank for consultation they had no doubt that the bees philip had lined came from the hives of these people if there were a bee tree at all they would not be allowed to cut it lieutenant coleman was at first disposed to return without revealing themselves to the strangers their curiosity however was so aroused and their desire was so great to learn something of their neighbours that the three soldiers crept back until only their heads were above the edge of the bank and their wondering eyes fixed on the house there might be women there and from a sense of modesty each man got back into his old blue overcoat they talked in husky whispers as they stared through the bushes expecting every moment to see some one come out for a pail of water or an armful of wood there's a man down there by the shed whispered philip and so timid of their kind had the soldiers become after seven years of seclusion during which they had not spoken to a human being that they ducked their three heads in a tremble of excitement presently bromley looked again and almost laughed out loud for the man was only a stump with something thrown over it that stirred with the wind there was no smoke from the chimney but it was midway between breakfast and dinner and fire was not to be expected at that hour in midsummer there were no clothes hung out to dry and no growing crops in sight but there were small stacks of corn stalks at different points on the field and these were in every stage of decay from the conical heap overgrown with vines to the flat mound of grey stalks through which the young chestnuts had sprouted and grown to a thrifty height a forest of hop vines grew over the eaves of the house flaunting their green tendrils in the soft south wind and giving an unmistakably homelike air to the place as no one appeared after an hour's watching it was more than likely that the family was absent for the day or asleep inside the longer the soldiers waited the greater their curiosity became and then they remembered their scarcity of food and felt the gold coins in their pockets it would be foolish to return without buying something from these neighbor people their vow was not to go down from the mountain and if they neglected this opportunity to supply their wants starvation would soon drive them into the confederacy vow or no vow bromley as usual was the first to come to a decision and then all three climbed boldly out upon the bank and prepared to visit the house as they advanced over the grass they buttoned their overcoats more closely about their throats and jingled the coins in their pockets to keep up their courage they looked down at their bare feet and legs which naturally made them timid at the prospect of meeting women and so huddled together for support they crossed the dry chip dirt and came around the corner of the house the door stood open above the smooth stone step and bromley struck it with his knuckles while his comrades waited behind him feeling instinctively in their momentary embarrassment for their collars and wristbands which had never before been out of their reach in the presence of the other sex if they had been less embarrassed they would have noticed the utter absence of all signs of habitation outside the house and that the door itself was sagging inward from its rusty hinges the interior was darkened by the sliding boards which closed the windows and gave forth a musty earthy smell there's nobody lives here said bromley in his strong natural voice at which coleman and philip were startled into a small spasm of feeling again for their shirt collars and then as he gave a kick to the lurching door they dropped their nervous fingers and followed him in
bromley opened one of the windows which let in but a dim light because of the thick mat of hop vines which had overgrown it the first object that caught the eyes of the soldiers was a considerable library of books crowded together on three shelves above the fireplace philip had his hand at once on the familiar cover of uncle tom's cabin bromley took down a faded volume of the anti-slavery record for the year eighteen thirty six and coleman went outside the door to examine a small book which bore in gilded letters on the cover the branded hand on the title page there was a woodcut of a hand with two s's on the open palm the story was of the trial and imprisonment of jonathan waller or walker at pensacola florida and a few pages on the author was shown dripping with perspiration in the pillory this book had been published in eighteen forty five and lieutenant coleman dropped it on the doorstep and hastened back to find something more modern in fact the three soldiers were moved by the same desire to find something anything that had been printed since the year eighteen sixty four so it was with the greatest disgust that they took from the lower shelf and threw down one after another such ancient history as captain cannot or twenty years of an african slaver eighteen fifty four the alton riots by rev edward beecher eighteen thirty eight abolition a sedition eighteen thirty nine memoir of rev elijah p lovejoy eighteen thirty eight and slavery unmasked eighteen fifty six there were other curious works on the same subject bearing equally remote dates on the second shelf there was a mixed collection of thin periodicals in blue yellow and gray covers such as the quarterly anti-slavery magazine the emancipator and the slave's friend and several volumes of speeches by william lloyd garrison and wendell phillips bearing date as late as eighteen fifty eight the upper shelf was filled with small books and pamphlets on temperance and prohibition not one of which had been published since the year eighteen fifty two lieutenant coleman and bromley were so keenly disappointed at finding among so many books nothing that threw any light on the state of the country since their arrival on the mountain that they were almost tempted to throw the library into the fireplace and burn it up by starting a fire with their flints the perfect order in which the books had been arranged was strangely in contrast with the otherwise wrecked condition of the room the excitement of the soldiers on seeing the library had prevented them from noticing that the hearthstone had been wrenched from its original position and that the earth had been dug out to some depth beneath it and thrown in a heap against the edge of the single bunk by the south wall stones had been pried from the back of the chimney and there was abundant evidence that some person had been hunting for treasure the rusty spade with which the digging had been done lay in the fireplace where it had been thrown by the baffled robber the bed tick had been ripped open with a knife and the straw with which it had been filled was scattered over the dry earth on the floor the blankets and everything of value in the house had been carried away it might be that murder had been committed here as well as robbery as there was no stain of blood on the mattress or on the floor lieutenant coleman concluded that the robber was only a cowardly thief who had stolen the property from the deserted cabin it would seem however that this man had had some knowledge of the dead mountaineer which had caused him to suspect that there was hidden treasure in the house possibly he had found what he sought the discovery of the house and its contents was so startling that the soldiers forgot all about the bee-tree they had come in search of the absence of everything in the nature of food forced itself upon their minds as they felt the coins in their pockets there might be corn in one of the tumble-down outhouses both were sadly decayed and broken by the winds and storms to which the strong walls and good roof of the house had not yet yielded the first shed contained a small heap of wood and a rusty axe and the other appeared to have been used as a cow stall the paths were overgrown with grass which indicated that years had passed since the place had been inhabited the good order in which the books had been left led the soldiers to doubt if the place had been visited since the robber had gone away 
it was true that the library was of a character that would be undesirable in a slaveholding confederacy and if any one had seen it since the robbery it was strange that he had not destroyed the objectionable books this state of things was so puzzling to lieutenant coleman and his comrades that they set out at once to make the circuit of this small tract on the mountain top which they naturally believed must be somewhat difficult of access there must be a road that led to it the robber might have climbed over the rocks through some difficult pass and so might the owner of the house but the cowshed would make it seem that domestic animals had been driven up from the valley the western front was the bolder side of the mountain and as unapproachable here as on their own plateau after the most careful exploration the remaining sides were found to be of the same character as the cashier's valley side beyond the dividing cliff this smaller tract of mountain top was supported by sheer ledges which rose above the forest below there might be some point in the wall where a man could scale it with the help of a long ladder but it was evident that no cow had ever fed in that stall it was past noon now and the soldiers sat down on a rock in the mild sunlight which poured over the dividing ledge and talked of the strange situation there have been human beings here said bromley at least two of them the fellow who lived in that house and the robber who looted it now i am not much of a detective but it is certainly our business to find out how they got here and how they got away how the robber got away suggested coleman for there is no doubt in my mind that the man who lived here was his victim yes said philip i am certain there was a murder committed here don't you see that if the murderer had carried off the books they would have been evidence against him sufficient to have convicted him of the crime this view of philip's was so plausible that the others adopted it they assumed that the unfortunate victim had been shot in the open field and buried where he fell if the crime had been committed so long ago that the grass had found time to take root in the hard paths it would have long since overgrown the shallow grave then it occurred to the soldiers who had helped to bury the dead on more than one battlefield that as time passed a shallow grave has a way of sinking the murderer would have been careful not to raise a mound and the very place of his crime should by this time be plainly marked by a long grassy hollow they started at once to search for the grave but they were thirsty not to say hungry after their exertions of the morning and so they went first to a spring which they had seen near the head of the path where they had climbed up it was a large bubbling spring and flowed under the rocks so nearly opposite to where the branch appeared on the other side that they knew it was the source of their own supply it was not pleasant to think how easily their neighbor in his lifetime might have turned it in some other direction thus stopping the wheels of their mill and possibly leaving them to perish of thirst after they had lain down on the ground and drunk from the spring they turned in the direction of the lonely house flattering themselves that they were after all pretty clever detectives by putting together the facts which they had now determined and proved they had made a rather shrewd beginning at the discovery of a crime they agreed as they went along that nothing further should be disturbed within or without the house until they should have unravelled the history of the foul murder that was they believed the method observed by the best detectives and coroners they might not establish their theory to-day or to-morrow but they could go and come by the new path they had found and sooner or later they would force the secret from the mute objects in the midst of which the crime had been committed as they arrived at this united and enthusiastic decision they were approaching the house on the opposite side to that which they had passed on their first coming the turf was so firmly rooted here that it was not easy to determine whether there had or had not been a garden on this side a thick clump of young chestnut trees had grown up since cultivation had been suspended and as the three soldiers turned around these they came suddenly upon something which exploded their fine-spun theories it was nothing less than a grave with an uncommonly high mound above it and marked at the head by a broad slab of oak 
besides the wild rose bush which grew out of the matted grass on the mound there was another object which staggered the soldiers more than the grave itself on the upper part of the headboard the following inscription was deeply cut here rest the bones of hezekiah walstow abolitionist and apostle of temperance who died here ended the letters which were cut with a knife evidently by the said hezekiah himself with the expenditure of much time and patience below the inscription was continued with black paint half written and half printed in one ungrammatical and badly spelled sentence it was somewhere between june twenty six and june the fourth eighteen fifty eight the other object found lying across the grave was the skeleton of the cow whose crumpled horns were attached to the bleached skull and whose white ribs provided a trellis for the rosebush strangest of all strange things in this mysterious affair one horn of the skeleton was hooked over the top of the slab so as to hold the great skull reversed close against the headboard on the side opposite to the inscription evidently the faithful creature had died of starvation during the winter which followed the death of her master by accident or through a singular exhibition of affection she had lain down to die on the hard snow which was banked high above the grave and as this melted the head of the cow had lodged in this remarkable position well said philip with a sigh for his pet theory whoever he was and however he came here his name was hezekiah walstow and there was no murder after all unless a third man came to bury him well, that's all settled said bromley resignedly but how about the cow did she come here in a balloon my dear fellow said lieutenant coleman we have not yet found how the men got here when we learn that it may make all the rest plain without entering the house again the soldiers made a second circuit of the field examining carefully every foot of the cliffs they were absolutely certain now that there was no road or path leading to this smaller plateau except that by which they themselves had come and yet here were the bones of a full-grown cow and the ruined stall which had at some time been her winter quarters they next examined the heaps of stalks which were sixteen in number and represented that many harvests but the older ones were little more than a thin layer of decayed litter through which the grass and bushes had grown up there might have been many others of an earlier date all traces of which had long since disappeared at first it seemed strange that a cow should have starved in the deepest snow in the midst of such surroundings on a closer examination however it appeared that the tops of the two larger stacks had been much torn and the stiff stalks cropped bare of leaves it was plain enough that the lean cow had wandered here on the hard crust of the snow and scattered the stalks as she fed even now these could be seen lying all about in the grass where they had lodged when the snow melted under one of the stacks another skull was found the owner of which must have died before the cow or have been killed for beef instead of one two domestic animals then had cropped the grass and switched at the flies on this plateau which was surrounded by inaccessible cliffs how did they come there by sunset the soldiers were no nearer to a solution of this difficult problem and so they filled their two pails with anti-slavery books and returned to ponder and wonder in the society of the bear and the six sad roosters they could sleep but little after such a day of excitement and they were scarcely refreshed by their night's rest when they returned on the following day to the deserted house this time they left their overcoats at home and took with them a loaf of cornbread for luncheon and the pails in which they intended to bring back more books they halted again before the oak slab bearing the name of hezekiah walstow apostle of temperance etc and crowned by the mourning skull of the cow as if to assure themselves of the reality of what they had seen and then they walked humbly into the house they could think of no guiding clue to start them in the solution of the problem of the cattle and so they weakly yielded to their curiosity about the books 
bromley cut away the thicket of hop vines which darkened the two windows and in the improved light they fell to examining the coarse woodcuts of runaway slaves with their small belongings tied up in a pocket handkerchief which headed certain advertisements in the periodicals the adventures of captain cannot was a thick book with numerous illustrations of a distressing character in one picture a jolly sailor with a pipe in his mouth was smilingly branding the back of an african woman while another sailor stood by with a lantern in broad daylight they hoped to find an account book or a diary but there was nothing of the sort on the shelves beyond one or two entries in pencil on a fly-leaf of the memoir of rev elijah p lovejoy acknowledging the receipt of a cask of meal or a quarter of lamb End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three starvation following their first visit the three soldiers returned during four successive days to the deserted house and the fields surrounding it by this time they had carried home the last of the books by pailfuls making the long journey through the cave of the bats by torchlight but they had arrived no nearer to the solution of the riddle of the cattle in fact so long as any part of the library remained where they had found it they had come to wander hopelessly in the early morning along the ledges which upheld the smaller plateau and then retire to the cool house to read after the books had been removed by the soldiers to their own side of the dividing cliff they found it so hard to leave them that they stopped at home for a whole week reading by turns and worrying themselves thin about the bones of the cattle they had abundant need at this time to keep their flesh and spirits for two more of the nine sacks of corn had been ground in the mill and the prospect for the future was more dismal than ever the end of this week of inaction however found the three soldiers in the early morning again standing by the deserted house lieutenant coleman had a systematic military mind and now the diverting books were out of their reach he stated the problem to his companions in this direct and concise way we know that two cattle have lived and died on this field undoubtedly replied bromley and philip we have examined three sides of the field and found that the cattle could not have come from either of these directions is not that so it is absolutely certain said the others therefore continued lieutenant coleman they must have come by the fourth side this conclusion was admitted to be logical but it provoked a storm of argument in the course of which the soldiers got wild-eyed and red in the face in the end however they consented to trim out the bushes which formed a thicket along the base of the ledge it seemed to lieutenant coleman that they must find some passage here and sure enough not far from the middle of this natural wall they came upon a low-browed opening which presently narrowed down to a space not much more than five feet square the farther end of this tunnel was closed by a pile of loose earth which was spread out at the base and had every appearance of having been thrown in from the other side of the ledge the rusty shovel was brought from the fireplace of the house and after a few minutes of vigorous digging a ray of light broke through the roots and grass near the roof of the hole the soldiers gave a wild cheer and rushed out into the fresh air to cool off that settles it said lieutenant coleman hezekiah walstow was the old man of the mountain and after josiah woodring buried him he filled up this passage the treasure he was searching for was the very cask of gold we dug out of the fake grave thanks to the sacrilegious behavior of the bear but how about the cattle said bromley still skeptical easy enough said coleman triumphantly they brought two young calves up the ladders this hitherto unsuspected passage through the ledge made everything clear it had evidently been wide open during all the years the old man had lived on the mountain 
it might have been screened by bushes so that any chance visitors like the hunters who came over the bridge would be easily deceived and not disposed to look farther than the ruined cabin and the non-committal gravestone it was not strange that the three soldiers had never suspected that there was an opening here through the rocks for a four-pronged chestnut had taken firm root in the grassy bank which josiah had thrown up and the old man had been dead six years when they first arrived on the mountain how soon after the burial the passageway had been closed it was not so easy to determine but numerous hollows which were afterward found near certain trees and rocks on the smaller plateau made it look as if Johiah had spent a good many moonlit nights in digging for the treasure before he gave it up altogether according to the story of andy the guide josiah himself must have died soon after his strange patron and most likely he closed the entrance to the passage in despair when he felt his last illness approaching there was still much for the soldiers to learn about the motive of the hermit in burying his surplus gold the comforts with which he had surrounded himself would indicate that he was no miser and his devotion to the cause of the slave made it extremely probable that he had willed his treasure to some emancipation society which had not succeeded in reclaiming it before the war and which for plenty of reasons had not been able to secure it since after the soldiers had reopened the passage through the dividing cliff so that they could pass readily from one plateau to the other they suspended further investigation and yielded to the luxury of reading which had been denied them so long the more they read of this peculiar literature from the library left by hezekiah walstow the more interested they became in the cause of the slave who they believed had been made free on paper by the impotent proclamation of abraham lincoln only to have his fetters more firmly riveted than ever by the success of the confederate arms among the other books there was one entitled twofold slavery of the united states this book had been published in london in the year eighteen fifty four and contained as a frontispiece a black and white map which so far west as it extended was remarkably like the one which hung on the wall of their house philip shed new tears over the pathetic lives of uncle tom and little eva and lieutenant coleman and george bromley grew more and more indignant as they read of the sufferings of the rev elijah p lovejoy and the self-confessed cruelties of captain Cannot however much the soldiers were wrought up by these books it was left to the mass of pamphlets and periodicals to fill their hearts with an unspeakable bitterness toward the institution which the united efforts of their comrades in arms had failed to overthrow it was evident that the old man had kept up some sort of communication by mail with the boston abolitionists and that his agent josiah had yielded his views if he had any to a liberal supply of gold for up to the time of his death he had continued to receive these periodicals as long as he received such dangerous publications he must have maintained correspondence with their editors and the more the soldiers became imbued by their reading with the ideas which had made a hermit of hezekiah walstow the more certain they became that he had willed his money to the cause of abolition or perhaps that he only held it in trust from the first otherwise why should he have adopted so crafty a method of hiding it from josiah to speculate on the cunning of these two men became a favorite occupation of coleman and bromley when their eyes were worn out with reading they were sure that every fresh lot of pamphlets had come through the settlement and up the mountain at the bottom of a cask of meal the old man had no mill or other means of grinding his corn which he must have cultivated for his cattle relying upon josiah for most of his food undoubtedly the very keg which the hunters had seen josiah carrying up by moonlight and which they believed was filled with whisky contained seditious literature enough if they had ever found it to have put them to the unpleasant necessity of hanging the bearer to the nearest limb 
so the soldiers continued to read to the neglect of every other duty through the entire month of august except that lieutenant coleman made a brief entry in the diary each morning and when they were out of food philip laid by his book long enough to grind another sack of the corn the few ears which had shown themselves on the plantation had been eaten green and the yellow and shrivelled stalks which had escaped the grub at the root stood in thin sickly rows it was an off year even for the chestnuts when in addition to this it was found in september that the potato crop had rotted in the ground the reading was brought to a sudden end and the soldiers found themselves face to face with a condition which threatened starvation and that before the winter began they remembered the bee tree and took up the line where philip had left it at the edge of the southern wall only to find that the bees flew on to some tree in the forest below and beyond the plateau when it was quite settled that they would have no supplies for the winter unless they bought them from the people in the valley with their gold pieces as the old man had done before them they settled down to their reading again foraging by turns for every edible thing they could find and putting off the evil hour when they should be forced to reveal themselves the more they read of these fiery periodicals the more they loathed their neighbors in the valley and shrank from communicating with them they knew that these people in the mountains seldom owned slaves themselves but they felt that they were in full sympathy with all the cruelties of which the yellow and blue covered pamphlets treated if the guineas in the hoard of hezekiah walstow meant anything they represented the proportion of the gold which had been contributed by anti-slavery societies in england and they began seriously to consider their moral obligation to return the entire sum to its rightful owners in order to accomplish this just purpose their lives must be preserved during the approaching winter and seeds secured for another planting after that they would find means to replace with iron the gold they had used in the construction of the mill and of various domestic utensils and when the treasure was restored to the cask they would find some way to open communication with the benevolent anti-slavery societies by the end of october they had eaten the last of their meal there were a few clusters of purple grapes on the vines and to these they turned for food still dreading to make any signs to their enemies with a dread which was born of the pamphlets they were reading for two days more they stained their hands and faces with the juice of the grapes until an exclusive fruit diet and meditation day and night on the awful wickedness of men weakened their bodies and began to affect their minds the dread hour had finally come and they could no longer delay making signs of their distress to this end they collected a pile of dry wood and heaped it on the point of rocks in full view of the settlement of cashiers it was growing dusk when everything was ready to start the fire and philip had come from the house with a lighted torch at the moment he was about to touch it to the dry wood bromley snatched the torch from his hand and extinguished it in the dirt coleman and philip tried to prevent this rash act of their comrade and in their excitement gave free expression to their anger but bromley stamped out the last spark of the fire without paying any heed to their bad language and frantic gestures are you mad he then cried retreating a little from what threatened to be an assault what do you think will be our fate at the hands of these people when we are found in possession of such books as we have been reading we should be imprisoned like lovejoy or branded like walker we might pay with our lives for your recklessness to-night philip and coleman were shocked at the danger they had so narrowly escaped and thanked bromley for his forethought and prompt action of course they must bury the books but they would have all the next day to attend to that and with many expressions of thankfulness they returned to the house and crept into their bunks 
when morning came they were weak and hungry with nothing whatever to eat but in spite of all this they heaped the anti-slavery books and pamphlets on the earthen floor carefully separating them from the works on temperance they had come to regard these books as little less than sacred and they naturally shrank from burying them in the ground happy thought there was the cave of the bats so packing them into the pails the soldiers carried the books in two toilsome journeys by torchlight to the middle of the cavernous passage and laid them carefully together on the stone floor they were well-nigh exhausted by this exertion but after a rest they found strength to close the entrance with brush and earth and to cover their work with pine needles half famished as lieutenant coleman and his comrades were they could only drink from the branch and wait patiently for night the poor old paralyzed rooster sitting in the chips by the door looked so forlorn and hungry that philip set him out among the dry weeds and lay down on the ground beside him so as to be ready to turn him about and set him along when he had plucked the few seeds in his front as for the bear and the five crippled roosters they shambled and hobbled about and shifted bravely for themselves there were still many things to consider as to how they would be received by these people and what success they would have in exchanging united states gold pieces for food and clothing perhaps they would be obliged to buy confederate notes at ruinous rates of exchange perhaps their visitors would confiscate their gold pieces at sight and take them down the mountain as state prisoners they must keep some coins in their pockets for barter which was their object in summoning their dubious neighbors but it would certainly be prudent to conceal the bulk of their money so the last thing the soldiers did on this november afternoon was to dump the gold that remained in the cask into a hole in the ground and cover it up as soon as it began to grow dark on the mountain they set fire to the pile of wood which was presently a great tower of flame lighting up the rocks and trees and forming a beacon which must be seen from valley and mountain for miles around at that hour and in the glare of their own fire they could see nothing of its effect in the settlement but they were sure it would be watched by the families outside every cabin and in this belief they moved about to the right and left of the flames waving their arms in token of their distress surely a fire on this mountain top where no native had set foot for seven long years would excite the wonder of the people below it could be kindled only by human hands and they would be eager to know to whom the hands belonged in the morning the three soldiers crept out to the smouldering remains of their fire which was still sending up a thin wreath of smoke on the distant road through the valley they could see groups of tiny people evidently watching and wondering they could come no nearer than the bridgeless gorge and so weak as the soldiers were after making every effort to show themselves in the smoke they made their way to the head of the ladders and climbed down to the field below philip stopped behind to run up the old flag on the pole for whatever effect that emblem might have on their neighbors they were determined to stand by their colors they found a few chestnuts and dried berries in the old field which they devoured with wolfish hunger as they crept along toward the gorge they hoped to see human faces on the opposite bank when they arrived but there was no one there to meet them they were not greatly disappointed for it was still early in the day and the people had a much longer journey to make from the valley there was the same old-time stillness on that part of the mountain the tinkling brook in the bottom of the gorge and the soughing of the wind in the tops of the tall pines on the other side there were still some sticks of the old bridge wedged in the top of the dead basswood the bridge which had served the old abolitionist in his lifetime and the destruction of which had served the purpose of the soldiers equally well the mild november sunshine lay bright on the faded landscape and the soldiers sat down on the dry grass to await the coming of their deliverers if one of the tall pines had been standing on their own side of the gorge they would have used their last strength to cut it down and fell it across the chasm 
they had put on their old blue overcoats to make a decent appearance before the people when they arrived but hour after hour crept slowly by and nobody came except tumbler the bear who had backed down the ladders and shambled across the field to join them by the sun it was past noon when he came and as he seated himself silently in the gloomy circle he made but a sorry addition to the anxious waiters why should no one come to their relief they knew that their fire had been seen where the presence of a human being would be regarded as little less than a miracle by the dwellers in the valley what if they had accepted it as a miracle altogether and avoided the place accordingly they were ignorant people and therefore superstitious or else they were as cruel and heartless as they were described in the weekly emancipator the rustling wind in the tree-tops and the occasional tapping of a woodpecker in the forest beyond became hateful sounds to their impatient ears bromley who was the strongest of the three and the more indignant that no one came to their relief wandered back upon the old field where he found a few more chestnuts which he divided equally with his half-famished comrades every mouthful of food helped to keep up their strength and courage and now the slanting rays of the afternoon sun reminded them that they must repeat their signal and that no time was to be lost in gathering wood for another fire there was still hope that relief would come before dark and philip was left to watch with the bear while coleman and bromley returned to the plateau the postmaster in the cove might be less superstitious they thought or less hard-hearted than the people in the valley if their strength held out they would have two fires that night no chance should be neglected as coleman and bromley dragged together a few dead limbs upon the edge of the great boulder they hoped that the postmaster had found the remains of the telescope as they knew he had found the army blanket which fell from the balloon so that when he saw their fire he would connect it in his mind with the other objects which had come down from the mountain it was after sunset when philip and tumbler appeared on the plateau no one had come even so far as the gorge and philip helped to carry the last of their wood to the rocky point where the blackened embers of the first fire lay in the thin ashes coleman and philip remained to kindle this beacon while bromley went to the cove side with a lighted torch and a bundle of fat pine knots when bromley saw the first smoke of the other fire across the ridge no light had yet appeared in the windows of the small post office moreover with his strong eyes he was sure he saw some object moving along the road in the direction of the office he waited a little waving his torch and then he applied it to the dry leaves and sticks at the base of the pile which flashed quickly into a blaze bromley was not content to move about in the light replenishing his fire but as often as a fat pine knot had become enveloped in flame he separated it from the pile and poked it over the edge of the great smooth rock to flare against the black storm stains as it fell and perhaps to start a new fire in the cove bottom a brisk east wind was blowing across the mountain which carried the smoke and sparks over the long roof of the post office bromley remained late at his work but at last his strength and his will-power yielded to the weakness that comes with hunger an overpowering drowsiness compelled him to leave the fire and go stumbling over the hill to the house where he found coleman and philip already asleep End of chapter twenty three chapters twenty four and twenty five of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four the rescue when the three soldiers awoke on the morning which followed the kindling of the two fires philip was too ill to leave his bunk and lieutenant coleman and bromley were too weak to drag themselves as far as the rocks where the embers were still smoking the sun was shining on their united states window and when they looked out at the door the old flag of thirty-five stars was floating bravely on the fresh wind three cheers for the stars and stripes and for sherman territory cried bromley and the weak cheers so exhausted the two men that they sat down on the wooden bench in a state of collapse 
faint as they were from hunger they were still fainter from thirst and after a moment's rest they staggered over to the branch and drank their fill of the cool water and laved their feverish faces in the stream they brought a cup of the water to philip who lay quietly in his bunk and was altogether so weak that they were obliged to hold him up while he drank there there said coleman as they eased him back on his pillow you must keep a good heart for some one will surely come to us to-day philip looked brighter for the draught of water but he only smiled in reply the sun was warm outside but the act of drinking while it had greatly revived and encouraged coleman and bromley had so chilled their starved bodies that they put on their overcoats and buttoned them up to the throat they could do no more in the way of calling for help than they had already done men had died of starvation before and it might be their fate to perish of hunger but they had a strong faith that the fires they had built for two nights on this uninhabited mountain would bring some one to their relief they regretted now that the reading of the abolition books had influenced them to delay so long their appeal for help to reach them their rescuers must fell one or more of the tall pines across the bridgeless gorge but they were too weak to go down the ladders and what wind there was blew across the mountain in the direction of the gorge so that they would not be able to hear the sound of an axe a mile away time had never dragged so slowly before the sun lay in at the open door and by the marks they had made on the floor as well as by the shadows cast by the trees outside they could judge closely of the hour they could hardly believe that it was only ten o'clock in the morning when it seemed as if they had already passed a whole day in vain hope of relief it was such a terrible thing to await starvation in the oppressive stillness of the mountain that bromley almost desperate with listening went to the branch and hung the bucket on the arm of the old slow john which presently began to pound and splash in its measured way dismal as the sound was it gave them something to count and relieved their tired ears of the monotonous flapping of the flag and of the rustling of the barren cornstalks they talked of the old man who had died alone on the other plateau he too might have died of starvation there were no signs of food in the deserted house when they had discovered it they had never thought of it before but his cunning agent might have been a villain after all he might have grown weary at last of lugging casks up the mountain by moonlight and getting the old man's gold by slow doles he must have had some knowledge of the treasure for which he dug so persistently afterward and in his greed to possess it he might have deliberately starved the old abolitionist they thought of hezekiah walstow burning beacon fires in his extremity when there was a good bridge to connect the mountain top with the valley and yet he was left to die alone the thought was not encouraging to coleman and bromley in their weakened nervous condition and tended to make them more than ever distrustful of the natives to whom they had appealed they withheld these disturbing suspicions from philip but the more they pondered on the subject the more they were convinced of the barbarity of the confederates and of their determination to leave them to their fate lieutenant coleman wrote what he believed to be the last entry in the diary it was november seventh eighteen seventy one and on the prepared paper of the book which treated of deep-sea fishing he stated briefly their starving condition and their fruitless efforts to summon relief they still had the tin box in which the adamantine candles had been stored and into this bromley helped to pack the leaves of the diary already neatly tied in separate packages and labelled for each year if he had had a little more strength he would have carried it to the forge and sealed the cover of the box which contained the record of their lives as it was they set it on the mantelpiece under the trophy formed of the station flags and the swords and carbines and laid a weight on the lid after this was accomplished lieutenant coleman lay down and turned his face to the wall and bromley seated himself on the bench outside the door too stubborn to give up all hope of relief the warm sun lighted the chip dirt at his feet and seemed to glorify the bright colors of the old flag as it floated from the staff he forgot his desperate situation for a moment as his mind turned back to the battle days when he had seen it waving in the sulphurous smoke 
it gave him no comfort however to think of his old comrades and the dead generals and the cause that was lost and when his eyes fell on the ground at his feet he tried to keep them fixed on a tiny ant which came out of a crumbling log the small thing was so full of life darting and halting and turning this way and that now it disappeared under the log and then it came out again rolling a kernel of corn by climbing up on one side of the grain to fall ignominiously down on the other bromley was just about to pounce on the grain of corn and crush it between his teeth when he heard a sound on the hill and raising his eyes he saw two men coming on toward the house they carried long bird rifles on their shoulders and to his starved vision they looked to be of gigantic size against the sky he could only cry out fred fred here they come these electric words brought coleman's haggard face to the door and even philip turned in his blankets the strange dress and wild appearance of the two soldiers clinging to the door of the house and the fantastic effect of the afternoon sun on the stained glass window as if the interior were on fire so startled the strangers that they lowered their rifles to a position for defence and turned from the direct approach until they had gained a position among the rustling corn stalk in front of the door the various buildings and the evidence of cultivation on the mountain top staggered the visitors and the haggard faces of coleman and bromley led them to believe that they had come upon a camp of the fabled wild men of the woods they had never seen a stained glass window before and to their minds it suggested some infernal magic so that the two valley men stood elbow to elbow in an attitude for defence and waited for the others to speak come on neighbors said bromley holding out his empty hands we are only three starving men one of the valley men was tall and lank and the other was sturdily built and at these pacific words of bromley they advanced still keeping close together we don't see but two said the stout man coming to a halt again where's the other one at he's too weak to get out of his bunk said lieutenant coleman for god's sake have you brought us food that's just what we have said the rosy-faced stout man who came on without any further hesitation we've brought you a corn pone we loud there might be some human critters starvin up here with that he whisked about the thin man and snatched a corn loaf from the haversack on his back how did you all get over here said the thin man it's seven years since the old bridge tumbled into the gorge there was no reply to this question for bromley was devouring his bread like a starved wolf while coleman had turned away to share his piece with philip the eagerness with which they ate seemed to please the two valley men who were willing enough to wait a reasonable time for the information they sought it was a fine opportunity to give some account of themselves and the rosy-faced man made good use of it we're plumb friendly he said and mighty glad we brought along the bread ain't we tom mightn't a done it if it hadn't been up for my old woman insistin she lowed some hunter fellows had got up here and couldn't get down again and she held fast to that idea while she was a bakin last night time your fire was a burnin it certainly takes women folks to get the rights of things don't it tom my name is riley hooper and this here friend of mine is tom zachary and we're nothin if we ain't friendly poor philip was unable to swallow the dry bread and coleman came to the door with the golden cup in his hand and begged one of the men to bring a cup of water from the branch tom zachary hurried off on this mission of mercy it's a wonder he exclaimed when he came back with the dripping cup that you all ain't been pisoned afore this drinkin out of brass gourds that's what ailed colum long time he had the green sickness but his woman was cookin into a brass kittle and that might a made some difference the two men now pressed into the house to see philip and bromley whose hands were at last empty and whose strength was fast returning came after them i'm just naturally put out said hooper when he saw the condition of philip that i didn't bring along something to warm up a cold stomach poor feller say where's your frying pan at i'll fix a dose for him here tom wake up fill this skillet with water out of the branch that no flavor of brass into it and as he spoke he whisked tom around again and took the haversack from his shoulders no you don't said he to bromley who came forward for more bread no you don't my boy i've viewed starvin humans before what you want to do is to go slow 
a dose of gruel is just the ticket for this here whole outfit the rosy-faced man was too busy with the fire and the gruel and too eager to improve the condition of the men he had rescued to ask any disturbing questions and tom zachary was so considerate in the presence of actual starvation that he seated himself on a three-legged stool and stared at the stained glass windows and the flags and the curious map on the wall it was just as well that bromley had removed the golden casters years before from the legs of the stools when they were found to make ruts and furrows in the earthen floor tom zachary would have been more astonished than ever if he had found himself rolling about on double eagles when the hot gruel had been served philip was so much revived as to be able to sit up on the edge of his bunk if it was delicacy that still prevented the visitors from asking questions it was a dread of overwhelming bad news that sealed the soldiers lips they had become so settled in their convictions and so confirmed in their strange blindness that they shrank from hearing the mortifying particulars so the five men sat staring at one another each party waiting for the other to begin soldier coats said the lean man nudging his companion and cavalry guns and swords said the rosy-faced one casting his eyes on the trophy and my affidavit said the tall one if them ain't the regular old signal flags one two one lieutenant coleman was thankful that his visitors had said nothing disagreeable thus far but he feared every moment that they would make some insulting remark about the old flag which they could see through the doorway bromley restrained himself as long as he could and then in reply to the three mild observations in which he thought he detected a shade of sarcasm he exclaimed well what of it we are not ashamed of our uniform or of our arms there ain't no reason why you should be my buck said the rosy-faced man soldierin is as good a trade as any other it's better in some said the tall one gentlemen said lieutenant coleman who began to fear more personal remarks you have saved our lives to-day we shall never forget your kindness or cease to feel ourselves your debtors you see our destitute condition we need food for the coming winter and seed for another year for which we are able to pay and if you know who owns this mountain top we shall be glad to arrange through you to buy it well now i'll be gormed said the rosy-faced man if he ain't a thoroughbred as soon as he gets fed up a little wants to buy these here rocks does he tom who do you reckon owns this mountain dunno said tom with a grin if you don't well i do said hooper expanding himself with an air of proprietorship and there ain't nobody never disputed my title to this upper country are you willing to sell it said lieutenant coleman i'll sell anything i've got said hooper looking more rosy and smiling than ever so i get my figure very well said coleman if we take the mountain top from the deep gorge up at what price would you value it well now said hooper if you really mean business this year track ain't worth a fortune timberland in these parts brings a dollar an acre when it brings anything rock land like this without no timber on to it is worth fifty cents but considerin the improvements and the buildin's he continued i reckon seventy-five would be dirt cheap it ain't ever been surveyed but allow there's two hundred acres above the gorge lieutenant coleman already had his hand in the pocket of his canvas trousers and bringing out two double eagles he handed them to the rosy-faced proprietor as a first payment hooper jumped up from his seat and took the two yellow coins in his hands and chinked them together and tossed them about as if he feared they might burn his palms durned if it ain't united states gold money tom he exclaimed passing one of the coins to zachary who was equally excited we ain't viewed that kind of money for seven years in these parts have we tom tom endorsed his companion's statement in pretty strong language and lieutenant coleman hastened to say that if the money was not satisfactory they could probably agree upon some rate of exchange at this point of the conversation the two mountaineers exchanged some words in a whisper and the soldiers believed they were agreeing upon the discount between united states and confederate money to fill up this awkward break in the conversation lieutenant coleman began again to express his gratitude to his rescuers now hold on captain exclaimed hooper facing about whatsoever me and tom has done we have done willin and nobody willinger and we're goin to stand by you to the end but we ain't goin no further in this business till you tell us how you got here the way we study it out you ain't treatin me and tom fair 
oh pardon me my good friends said lieutenant coleman i had no intention of being rude we came here in the summer of eighteen sixty four in the line of our duty as union soldiers and when the war ended with the success of the confederates what cried the two men together gasping in amazement at what they heard and the union was destroyed continued lieutenant coleman and the capital fell into the hands of the confederates and slavery was restored exclaimed bromley and the flag was disgraced and robbed of its stars put in philip with such voice as he could command the two mountaineers stood open-mouthed for a moment and then they burst into peals of laughter <laughs> cried the rosy-faced man slapping his leg and throwing his wool hat on the floor as if it had been a brick-brack if that ain't the jolliest thing i have heard and it's kind of serious like too why man there ain't no confederacy it's the old united states from canada to the gulf of mexico and from the atlantic ocean clear across to the pacific and general sherman gasped philip he's general of the army up in washington right now and general grant is president cried the rosy-faced man somehow the interior of the house grew vague and misty as if a sea fog had swept in through the windows everything and everybody danced and reeled about until the soldiers fell away from the embrace of their deliverers quite exhausted by the excitement and the news they had heard while all this was going on philip lay back on his blanket and shed tears of joy over the wonderful news in fact there wasn't a dry eye in the room even the eyes of the men from cashiers glistened with moisture as they vied with each other in discharging facts like cannon-balls into the ears of the astonished soldiers they gave them a rough history of the end of the great war of the tragic death of lincoln and of some of the events which had since taken place in the united states there were thirty-five stars on the old flag when we came here cried philip coleman and there's thirty-seven now said hooper thirty-seven repeated the soldiers looking at one another through their tears thirty-seven the soldiers ate some more of the bread from the haversack and with renewed strength went out into the afternoon sunlight coleman and bromley supported philip and all five sat down under the old flag and as they sat there together like brothers the soldiers told the others why they had first come to the mountain and the bad news they had got by flag and the resolution they had made and all that had come of it and when they had done speaking tom zachary whose face had grown longer and sadder as he listened to their story said he had something to tell them for which he hoped they would forgive him i was only a boy in the war time said tom and i lived with my kinfolks in the settlement at the foot of the tenth mountain general thomas commanded the home guard brigade with headquarters at Qualertown in the cherokee country and he had signal flag men like you all and amongst the rest there was one named bud bryson now bud was mighty pert and he boasted as how he could study out any cipher that ever was made if only he had time enough so when the general heard that there was a yankee station on that mountain he sent bud with a spyglass to make out the cipher and read the telegraphs for him many's the day i stayed out on the south ridge with bud and wrote down the letters as he read em off and turn em which way we would we could never make head nor tail of em it was a z q j g and such fool letters then after two weeks hard work bud bryson was no nearer to making sense of the letters than when he begun though he did always say that if they had only give him time he would have studied out the trick but the general got tired of waiting on bud and one day he sent a squad of fifteen cavalry soldiers to capture the stations the soldiers started up the mountain in the early morning with bud to guide em and give em points i went up with the rest just to see the fun and when we got to the top the soldiers rushed in on two sets of men saw in the air with their flags and sending messages both ways lieutenant swan was the officer's name a big red man and mighty mad he was when the soldiers took him they searched him from head to foot and amongst the papers on him they found the secret cipher bud had been looking for what with guarding the prisoners and the prospect of capture and more fifteen troopers was too scant a crowd to divide into two squads and so the captain ordered bud to stay on the mountain and give the stations ahead enough news to keep em quiet until he come back that game suited bud mighty well and having nobody to help him he made me stay with him to take down the letters 
we had the camp just as they left it with plenty of rations and coffee to drink such as we hadn't tasted for years and every time bud looked at the flags he burst out laughing it was somewhere near the end of july when we took the mountain and that same afternoon bud began to figure the letters of his first message crooked according to the cipher and get it ready to send on tom he says to me with a grin i reckon we better kill off general sherman first and then he laughed and rolled over on the blankets next morning he sent the message and when the telegraph come back to know if the news was true he sent word it was honor bright and signed the lieutenant's name james swan it was three weeks before the squad got back from chattanooga way and all the time bud kept sending lies about great confederate victories he was careful what he sent too and figured on the dates and kept all the messages he had sent before wrote down in order so he wouldn't get mixed when we got all ready to leave bear cliff which was the tenth station bud flagged an order to send on that relief was coming now after we started east we picked up a station every morning and as soon as bud got his hands on the flags he began to lie more than ever closing up the war with a dash we had over fifty prisoners when we took the three men off from upper bald and there having been six on every other station we naturally thought we had found the last and the cavalry went away with their prisoners to Kuala Town. chapter twenty five conclusion after the straightforward story of tom zachary which explained the cunning method by which lieutenant coleman and his comrades had been deceived by the flag messages the soldiers could feel no resentment toward tom they were so happy in the possession of all the good news they had heard that they would have shaken hands with bud bryson himself if he had been one of their rescuers now i reckon said the rosy-faced man as he got on his feet to go down the mountain considerin the way things has turned out you all won't keer about investin in property in this upper country and i'll give you back your money he continued looking fondly at the two yellow coins coleman and bromley however insisted that a bargain was a bargain and that they wanted the land more than ever they should go away they said the next day if philip was able to make the journey and lieutenant coleman pressed another coin upon hooper for which he was to bring them a supply of clothing which they could wear as far as asheville it all seemed like a dream to the three belated soldiers when their visitors had gone but bromley who was the more practical reminded his comrades that the anti-slavery societies must have been long since disbanded and that the gold was theirs by the right of discovery so after making a supper of the cornbread from the haversack coleman and bromley fell to work with a will stripping the mill of its golden bands and hinges and hasps and late into the night the windows of the forge glowed and beamed and the ruddy firelight streamed out through the cracks in the logs where bromley the goldsmith was smelting and hammering the precious metal into bars and beating into each while it was soft the impress of a double eagle reversed when all the gold was packed in the very cask in which they had found it and so wedged and padded with leaves of the temperance books that it no longer chinked when it was moved a book cover was nailed on the head and the package was addressed to lieutenant frederick henry coleman u s a washington d c the tin box containing the diary and the flags and swords and such books as they wanted to keep were gathered together and packed for transportation by noon of the following day the two mountaineers appeared again looking like old clothes men as they came over the hill when the three soldiers got out of their tattered clothing and into the butternut and gray suits which had been borrowed for them from the neighbor folk in the settlement the misfits were such that they looked hardly less comical than before philip was the first to appear from the house ready for the descent his hat was a bell-crowned beaver his trousers were turned up halfway to his knees and he carried in his hand the alligator-skin bag which had belonged to the beautiful lady of the balloon after they got down the ladders coleman carried the cask as far as the gorge resting at intervals but never permitting the two mountaineers to test its weight or even suspect its contents philip and bromley divided between them the flags and sabres the remaining carbine the map and the tin box containing the diary hooper and zachary were occupied with the six sad roosters and tumbler the bear ambled along behind the men as they picked their way down the mountain 
it was really a perilous journey along the rough trunk of the great pine which lay across the dark chasm but bromley shouldered the cask and walked over as steadily as old tumbler himself and arrived on the opposite side he set it on end in the tail of the steer-cart which was hitched to a sapling alongside the very rock on which andy the guide had been seated when he told the story of the old man of the mountain the tall pines were whispering together in the soft wind as unconcernedly as if it had been seven days instead of seven years since the soldiers had stood on that spot before and the tinkling stream below was still chinking on its way like silver coins in a vault at first philip mounted the seat beside tom zachary and took charge of the fowls jolting in a yellow croaking mass between his feet except the old paralyzed rooster which he earned tenderly in his lap he was too excited to ride however and presently he got down and walked with the others at every stage of the descent the soldiers were learning new facts about the war which made their return to the united states a triumphal and delirious progress by the time they reached the hill pastures where they were greeted by some of the very same copper bells that had startled the cavalcade going up they began to be joined by the people who had heard of their discovery they came in twos and threes and whole families to swell their train so that when they turned into the sandy road through the valley they were attended by a joyous procession of curious followers which steadily increased until the cart with the bear shambling alongside came to a stand by the woodpile of elder long misnamed shiftless philip took off his bell-crowned hat right and left to the women and lieutenant coleman greeted aunt lucy who leaned on her crutches at the gate among the purple cabbage heads with the stately courtesy he had learned at west point riley hooper mounted the woodpile and announced with a merry twinkle in his eye that he and tom had captured the haunts that had been a doin the ghost business so long on old whiteside at which aunt lucy glared through her spectacles as if the remark were a personal affront to her and the elder exclaimed fervently may the lord's will be done when presently the mail carrier came along in his one-horse gig lieutenant coleman wrote a hurried dispatch to the adjutant general of the army announcing the relief of his station and the cask containing the treasure was committed to the carrier's charge to be sent on by express as if it were only the commonest piece of luggage when the sun disappeared behind the mountain ushering in the long twilight in the valley the crowd was still increasing and one of the last to arrive was the old postmaster from the cove when he came the soldiers and their deliverer were seated with the elder's family about the supper-table in the kitchen where the neighbors lined the walls and filled the doors and windows eager to hear more of the life on the mountain the great round table itself excited the soldiers surprise for besides being covered with a gaudy patchwork of oilcloth it was encircled at a lower level with a narrow ledge which held the plates and cups and knives and forks while the great centre was loaded with smoking loaves of corn-bread platters of fried chicken bowls of potatoes jugs of milk and pots of fragrant tea room was made for the postmaster at the hospitable board and after the elder had said grace standing he invited everybody to help himself at the same time giving the table a whirl which sent the smoking dishes and the flaring tallow dips circling around on an inner clockwork of creaking wooden wheels it was altogether such a bewildering and unexpected movement that philip nearly fell out of his chair and even bromley who had just laid a piece of corn-bread on the edge of the oilcloth dropped his knife as he saw the bread sail around until it rested in front of the postmaster very much as the blanket had fluttered down from the balloon after the supper was over and all the neighbor folks had been satisfied eating and drinking where they stood lieutenant coleman speaking for his companions related such incidents in connection with their life on the mountain as he chose to disclose he ended his long story by presenting the bear to riley hooper and the six sad roosters to tom zachary with a sum of money to pay for their keeping the library of abolition books he presented to elder long telling him where he would find it in the long cavern it's plum quair said the postmaster after lieutenant coleman sat down did yez never drop such things as a spy-glass 
we did indeed said all three of the soldiers together and mighty well battered and twisted it was said the postmaster i found it amongst the rocks a spell after the blanket landed front of my door and i always loud how fell out of the balloon the soldiers laughed i come dreadful nigh coming up there in sixty nine said the postmaster say strangers he continued dropping his voice tell me true did you ever view the haunt up yonder we never had the pleasure said lieutenant coleman well, that's square too said the postmaster and you live in our seven years for i viewed it and no mistake that winter for i allowed to come up a gyrating and cavortin on the avalanche on the moonlight the same being the night before it fell bromley sat back in his chair and laughed aloud here's the haunt you saw he exclaimed slapping philip on the shoulders no no cried the postmaster getting on to his feet with a scared look in his face you're funny with me stranger for no human could have got there where i viewed the haunt but he did said bromley and then he described how philip fell and how he got up again by the way continued bromley looking around is the young woman present who used to live alone in the house under sheep cliff at this question some of the neighbor women pushed forward a tall stoop-shouldered girl with a sallow face who struggled to avoid the gaze of the soldiers what for you want to know she said in a sullen voice still pushing to get back to her place against the wall oh nothing said philip only we used to see you through the telescope the soldiers and the family sat for a time in silence after the most of the neighbors had gone well i declare said the postmaster giving a twirl to the creaking table which caused the last guttering candle to approach him in a smoky circle how things do come round the light reddened the postmaster's face for an instant and gleamed on his glasses as he blew out the candle and pinched the wick and so ends the history of the three soldiers who remained in voluntary exile for seven years and were happily rescued at last end of chapter twenty five end of the last three soldiers by william henry shelton